Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Kristen Skelton. I'm the founder of Bud Funding and here we are all about sustainable education. And today I'm really excited because I have an expert with me and her name is Mindy Summers and she's gonna share some interesting tips and facts about the amazing world of insects and butterflies. But before I jump right into that, I want to just remind everyone about the Bud Funding Academy that is launching this fall. I am so excited about this program. It's going to be colorful, interactive, hands-on. I think there's about 30 projects that you could potentially do in this program. You don't have to do them all, of course, but it's gonna be lots of fun. You're not gonna be learning from a textbook, anything like that. It's gonna be interactive, hands-on, colorful, all that good stuff. So join, uh, to join the waitlist, the link is in the description. So. I can't wait to see all of your beautiful faces there. So now back to the amazing world of butterflies and insects. So Mindy Summers, who is here with me today, she studies and teaches courses in invertebrate zoology, entomology, evolution, and animal behavior as a faculty member of the University of Calgary. She is currently working with students in her courses to document and digitalize invertebrate biodiversity and understand pollinator and plant relationships in the city of Calgary. You and all of you can actually contribute to her work through the Calgary Pollinator Project. And we'll have a link for that. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll put that in the description. So if anyone wants to join that, definitely click the link and follow the direct directions there. We'd love to have your input. So Mindy, how are you doing today? And thank you so much for joining me. Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. So let's dive right in. So I want to know, because when we think of pollination, we typically think of bees, but I know that there's more than just bees. So which insects pollinate? Yeah, that's a great point. So any insect or animal in general, for that matter, that touches the parts of a flower and transfers pollen can be considered pollinators. So many people, like you mentioned, think immediately of bees and butterflies as pollinators, but it turns out that wasps, flies, moths, and many beetles and true bugs act as pollinators. And in some cases, flies and wasps uh, do a lot of pollination, particularly here in Calgary. Okay, that's really interesting. So basically, if they're kind of getting pollen on them and walking over to another plant, then they would be considered potentially a pollinator? Yeah, exactly. So some insects, um, you know, like bees, they're going after the nectar in a flower. And so, you know, they when they're visiting, pollen is attaching to them and they're moving, you know, to different flowers. So those can be considered really effective pollinators. Um, but many other insects happen to just live in and around the insect parts. So you could almost call that accidental pollination, where because that's where they're happening to live, they're actually, you know, getting pollen attached to them and moving and moving about in that way. Um, so yes, we would consider all of those insects um, to be pollinators. And if you're working on our Calgary Pollinator Count Project, we're gonna be asking you to document and count any insect that's on a flower. Okay, that's really cool. And so you mentioned moths. And one question I've always had about moths is, why are they attracted to light? Because <laughs> it's like, you're in the dark, you're on your cell phone, you're on something, and this moth will not leave you alone. So I want to know, what what is that that attracts them? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so many insects display this attraction to light. Um, and so what we call that is positive phototaxis. So that's being attracted to light. Um, so some animals actually exhibit the opposite, negative phototaxis, so they'll be moving away from light. So you can, um, you know, be thinking about different insects that respond in different ways to light. Even when you're out walking around, you know, some will scurry away when they're under a shadow, others will come to light. Um, and so there's a lot of different ideas in terms of why some of our insects, particularly moths, might be moving towards light. Um, it's possibly as a way to navigate, you know, such as by the moon or stars. Um, and some insects, if you're familiar with fireflies, uh, you know, use light actually to, to find mates. Um, in some cases, some also use it 
to trick other animals uh, to find food. So some, some fireflies are actually predatory and they use that light to actually uh, attract food. So as you can imagine, when we have our lights on, on our cell phones or on street lights or in our houses at night, we can cause all sorts of um, issues for, for insects that are used to be navigating by moon or starlight with our artificial lights um, in the city. So that's always one thing to kind of think about is, you know, the benefits of having darker skies in some areas. Um, but at the same time, uh, entomologists really do exploit a lot of insects attraction to light uh, because, you know, we'll set lights out that then attract insects to them. And so a couple of weekends ago, uh, the weasel head put together a great moth appreciation night. And so they had lights all over the park uh, to bring in the different moths and everyone was out, you know, identifying and discovering diversity of moths uh, because they do come to light. Very cool. So do insects feel cold? I'm curious. Yeah, that's a really, um, that's a really interesting question. So yes, insects can sense temperature. Um, mosquitoes and many flies, for, insects, uh, for instance, have um, sensory receptors for both hot and cold. They'll have those on their antennae in different parts of their body. Um, and if you're thinking about cold in terms of winter, uh, it's actually pretty interesting. A lot of insects have a whole variety of different survival strategies. So some insects will be living or sleeping underground throughout the winter, but there's also some known insects that are active throughout the winter. And so they're, they are able to survive even in those cold air conditions. Very cool. And so summer, when we're in summer, we're in summer right now. And when we think of summer, we think of mosquitoes. So I wanna know, so there's always an itch associated with a mosquito bite. So my question is, why do mosquitoes bites itch and do other mosquitoes, all, or sorry, do other animals also get an itch from the bite? Yeah, so when a mosquito bites us, it's essentially piercing our skin using a really specialized mouth part. It's called a proboscis uh, to, to suck up the blood. Um, and so as the mosquito is, is biting and feeding on the blood, um, it does inject some of its own saliva kind of into, into our skin and into our body. And so our body is actually responding to that saliva like a foreign substance um, in our body. And essentially that is what's causing that, that bump and, and itching. Um, and so similar to like, if you, if you touch a plant that might cause a rash and you have that kind of antihistamine response, that's essentially what's happening uh, with an insect bite. Um, so, yeah, so that's what causes that itchiness and that inflammation and that swelling. Um, and so, you know, you will see other animals responding to kind of fly bites and, and insect bites. And so, you know, there's likely a similar response happening there as well. So other animals might get itchy as well? Um, you'll definitely see that swelling um, and those bumps. So I'm sure people, I see you know, on my dog, when we go out walking and she's covered in mosquitoes, she'll have all sorts of kind of that inflammation and um, from the bites from the different insects as well. And when it comes to mosquitoes, I've heard people say, oh, mosquitoes love my blood. I get bitten a lot. And whereas me, I'm like, I, I don't seem to get bitten that much. So I'm just wondering if there's any truth to that statement and what factors would maybe make a mosquito choose one person over the other? Yeah, so mosquitoes are actually using kind of a, a set of different sensory inputs to find you know, who they're going to actually be getting their next meal from. So mosquitoes are known to take in information like carbon dioxide um, in the air. So we admit carbon dioxide when we're breathing. So they'll use that to kind of find a potential host. Um, there's, you know, evidence that they're also taking in information like heat or the amount of water vapor to find the next host. Um, and the same, there's been um, a few studies that have seen kind of different odors or chemicals that are released um, attract different mosquitoes. And so different species of mosquitoes kind of will favor one of these different types of, of information um, more than other that, but kind of all three of those might be kind of contributing to mosquitoes searching out and, and finding particular people.
right? So if a person is maybe has more of those factors than another, then they would be a more likely meal. <laughs> yes, that could be, they could, it could be easier, you know, the, to, for the mosquitoes to either find you um, or if given a choice amongst different potential um, food sources, one might get chosen over the other. Okay, okay, cool. So before you mentioned about moss, so I'm just curious, what's the difference between moss and butterflies? Yeah, so a butterfly is a type of moth. So okay. moths essentially like as a as a group of insects, one small group of, of moths are the butterflies. Um, so butterflies are a type of moth. Um, there are some kind of tendencies that you'll see in butterflies versus moths, but there's so many exceptions. So I'll give you a few of the things you tend to see in butterflies. Um, so physically, butterflies tend to have kind of clubbed antennae, if you're looking close. A lot of times you'll see their bodies are a bit slender and smoother, um, and you'll see them hold their wings kind of outward. Uh, the other thing you might notice is that butterflies tend to be more active in the daytime. And so in contrast, moths tend to be more active at night. Uh, physically, you'll see that they tend to have feathery antenna. They'll have fuzzier and thicker bodies, and some will hold their wings in a tent-like fashion. Um, as part of the life cycle, another difference you might see is moths tend to form silk cocoons, while butterflies will have a hardened um, chrys chrysalis. Um, but there are many, many exceptions. And so some of the really spectacular moths are day flying and they have really bright colors. So here in Calgary, you can find quite a few day flying moths that probably a lot of people are thinking are butterflies. Um, but if you look closely, you'll probably see some of those um, moth characteristics. And where does butterfly get its name? Does it like, I'm just curious, back in the day, butter, it doesn't really, if you look at a butterfly, you're like, hmm. I'm not seeing the connection there. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually had to look this up because I didn't know like what the entomology or the, the kind of the name of the where butterfly comes from. Um, so when I looked this up, I actually found uh, a website uh, from Carleton University where they were exploring this question. Um, and so it seems like there's a few different ideas where the origin of the name might come from. Um, so one idea is it's because a really common butterfly uh, in Europe kind of has a buttery yellow color. So that could be where the name comes from. Um, it's also suggested that the name might be for the color of their poop, which tends to be a buttery yellow color. Um, and it's also been suggested uh, that people at one time would see butterflies coming to their to the their butter that they had sitting out. And so that's how it was a, a butter fly. So a fly that's coming and visiting butter. Um, but yeah, this is a, a great question. And it seems like no one quite knows exactly yeah. uh, where the name came from, but it would be worth exploring more. Yeah. So how many different types of butterflies are there in the world? Yeah, so estimates are at around uh, 18,000 different species worldwide. Um, there's around 300 that are known in Canada. And right before we, we met today, I went and checked on iNaturalist, which is a great place to like see what butterflies have been recorded in, in different areas. Um, so right now, there's been 59 species recorded here in Calgary um, and around 157 in Alberta. Um, there's probably more that haven't been documented yet. So it's always great for people to contribute their, their observations to that website. Yeah, iNaturalist has a website and it also has a really cool app. I'll link it in the the description below so anyone can download that. And it's really neat because you record your observations that you come across in your own area. And then, you know, and then that can help research all over the world. So it's a really neat, neat app or, or website. Do butterflies have brains and hearts? <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, oh, they do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, our insects have, you know, full nervous systems. They have, you know, the, the brain is part of their sensory system. Um, and then they do have a circulatory system as well. 
And so I heard that butterflies eat, um, and then they, well, obviously they eat, but they taste with their feet. So is it because they, they land on something, then they're going to taste it to see if it's edible or how, how does that work? Yeah, that's a really good point. So yeah, um, many insects, including butterflies, have essentially, you know, chemoreceptors um, on their legs. Um, so that's kind of what, when people are saying they're tasting, that's kind of what it means is they're able to sense chemicals. So, you know, that's what we're doing when we're, when we're tasting and that's what butterflies are doing. So they do have those kind of chemo sensors on their legs. Um, they also have them associated with, you know, other parts of their body, including on their mouth parts. Um, so there's kind of lots of, um, sensory organs kind of all over, uh, the bodies of, of insects. So yeah, they're able to, to taste and see with different parts of their body um, than what we would normally think of um, for ourselves. So what would be a butterfly enemy and what could we do to help them protect them? Yeah, so butterflies are important kind of prey and food sources for a number of different predators. Um, so birds, uh, spiders, lizards, small mammals, and other insects will all prey on butterflies. Uh, butterfly larvae, so the caterpillars are the caterpillar stage for butterflies. Uh, that's a really important food source for a lot of birds. Um, so you'll see a lot of researchers really interested in, you know, a lot of caterpillars tend to really specialize on a certain type of plant for food. Um, and so you'll see a lot of interest in making sure that we're protecting those plants, as well as the plants that the adult butterflies are feeding on uh, to make sure that there's food for birds. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, in terms of enemies, I might say one of the biggest enemies might be us <laughs> in some way. And, you know, one of the most important things we can do is, is habitat protection, I think, in a lot of different ways. Um, so making sure there's habitat for both the adult and the caterpillar form um, of butterflies, making sure there's food available for both. And for some species like monarch butterflies that disperse really long distances, you know, there's a need for us to cooperate with others to make sure that there's habitat for butterflies throughout their entire migration corridor. So in all of those different areas. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's one of the most important things we can do is, you know, make sure there's there's habitat and there's lots of plants and, and food for, for butterflies. So no pesticides, I'm assuming. And then, or is there such a thing as like an organic pesticide? Um, or just try and skip that altogether. Yeah, so, you know, watching out in terms of insecticides, um, there are different ones. Some are a bit universal and they'll affect all insects. Others are more specialized. Um, in general, you know, trying to go for more natural deterrence is, is definitely going to be better. Um, so avoiding the use of pesticides and insecticides um, and making sure to plant lots of native uh, plants uh, that will support our native butterflies. And the important thing with, with the natives is really making sure we're giving food for the caterpillar stage. So, you know, while it might be exciting to see, you know, adults, um, that that caterpillar stage is really important and we have to make sure there's food for, for them. And many of them only eat certain types of native plants. Okay. Yeah. In order to get the adults, we need to feed the, the young ones. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. For sure. And so I've heard that butterflies have really long tongues, and I thought that was really interesting. What would be a typical, ty typical length of a butterfly? Oh, I'm t getting tongue twisted on this tongue thing. What would be a typical length of a butterfly tongue? Yeah, so if you're looking at a butterfly kind of out, you can think that its tongue or its tongue-like structure called a proboscis, if you were to kind of unfurl it, would be about one and a half times the body length in general. So yeah, the tongue is about the body length and then a half. So, and you know, we have a quite a range of different size of butterflies here. So that will give you a bit of a sense. Um, I did look up kind of some 
of the longest lengths of, um, of butterfly tongues. Um, and so there's one species where the tongue is approximately twice as long and it has a length of about 45 millimeters. So it's a pretty, yeah, it's a very long, long. I'm just tongue. wondering like how they wrap that up in their mouth. <laughs> um, yeah, so you will see it kind of um, coiled um kind of and the mouth parts are kind of located but yeah the next time you look at a butterfly kind of check out those external mouth parts and you'll see you'll see the coil and then envision that kind of unfurling yeah and think about us having a tongue length you know, one and a half times our, our body height wow how long do butterflies live yeah, so it really depends by species. Um, so you'll get a different kind of range. So in general, you know, think about a few weeks to a few months. Um, most information, you know, is known about monarchs because they're a critically endangered species um, or butterflies that are reared in captivity. So that's where you'll find the most information. But you can definitely look up for a specific butterfly, you know, how, how long. Um, and so, you know, um, typically when you think about kind of the, the life cycle, you'll have a few weeks kind of in that larval stage or that caterpillar stage. They then pupate for about two weeks, like a week to two weeks, and then they'll be in the adult stage for around two to four weeks, you know, flying as butterflies. Um, some of the longest lived will be 13 months old, so a bit over a year. Um, and some of the shortest live will have, they'll be in the adult stage for just one or two days. Wow. So yeah, some of the coppers and blues, you have to be out just on the right day to be able to see the adults. Wow. And do you have any advice for someone wanting to get into the biological sciences? Yeah. So um, I would totally encourage anyone interested in the biological sciences or particularly with, you know, butterflies, insects, um, plants um, to get outside and, and get curious and start asking questions. There is so much to explore just in our own backyards. Um, and there's a lot that we still need to learn about, you know, what life cycles are like, what the biodiversity is here in our backyards and urban environments uh, specifically. And we have a lot to still understand and how to best protect and conserve what is here in our backyards. Um, so yeah, so I would highly recommend, you know, getting outside, uh, exploring as much as you can. And there's a lot of great resources of citizen science, like iNaturalist, as well as community organizations and groups like naturalist societies, friends of different parks, uh, that you can go out and do nature walks and bring your whole list of questions uh, that you accumulate and just ask people who are kind of out exploring, um, out exploring nature. And I'm also curious, what spurred your personal interest into the field you're working in? What brought you, brought you to the work that you're doing now? Yeah, so that's a really fun question. Um, so when I was younger, I spent a lot of time kind of out exploring my backyard growing up. Um, and I was always collecting lots of bugs and insects and snakes and kind of whatever I found um, uh, all the time. And so at that time, I was just really, really excited. Um, and then I actually, when I went to university, I saw the ocean for the first time. Um, and so I grew up inland, so I never even thought about, you know, what it would be like to explore the ocean. I became completely fascinated in the ocean and spent about 10 years just studying marine biology and oceanography. Um, and then when I came back to Calgary, I was actually able to get back to kind of the roots of my passion as a, um, that I had when I was growing up. Um, and now I'm really studying plant and pollinator relationships. So it's almost kind of a circle, but I think it really speaks to, you know, I'm so lucky as a scientist to get to explore things that excite me and interest me and go in different directions. Um, but yes, I've always been someone that really likes exploring what's right outside my, my door. And if people would like to find out more about your research, how would they, how would they do so? Yeah, so one way I would, we would really love to have more and more people actually involved in our research. 
And so one project that we just launched this summer is the Calgary Pollinator Count that probably will be expanding outwards, um, you know, beyond just Calgary for next year. And we hope to have this be an ongoing project. Um, and there's two ways that you can get involved. So one way is to take photographs of insects on flowers, so any pollinators, um, and upload those onto iNaturalist. And the other way is you can make your own at home um, quadrat or square that you would put around a plant of interest and then count how many insects come and visit. And so this project is gonna give us some really important information. You know, first just what pollinators are here in the city. Uh, last year, students in my course found a few different endangered species of insects in the city. Um, so it'll give us a sense of that. And it will give us a good understanding of what we can plant to, you know, make sure that we're conserving those species. Um, it will also give us good understanding of what plants support the most diversity of pollinators throughout the season. Um, and so this is information that, you know, city managers are really interested in as they're doing restoration work and conservation projects. And we've also been getting lots of requests from community gardeners and homeowners in terms of what to plant. Mm -hmm. And the one thing we haven't even looked at at all are just plants in people's backyards. So some of the non-native plants that are really common. And so that's why we really need more people out there looking and taking photographs and doing counts to, to help us explore more. So that's a great project to get involved in. Um, I Yeah, I sent you the links, so you can add that here. And you can also check out, we have a website, it's biodiversity.ucalgary.ca. So if you'd like to see any of our other work with digitizing our native bees, um, kind of creating different resources, all of that is up on, on our website as well. Okay, awesome. So I will put that in the description, uh, the link to be involved in the Calgary Pollinator Project. I'll also put that website link in the description as well. And um, as well, you'll also have the link to join the Bud Funding Academy waitlist. So definitely get your name on that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Mindy, thank you so much for joining me today. I learned so much. I love butterflies. I, I love dragonflies. I love all the, all the flies, all the bugs. Um, I actually am afraid of worms and I'm trying to get over that fear, but I do, I do love, I try to uh, pollinate, uh, have the pollinating you know, native plants in my yard. And uh, yeah, I think it's really important. I love the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much to everyone else for joining me. And um, definitely, if you want to get involved, follow, follow those links and I will see everyone next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.